Okay, so, well, so thank you all for uh, staying so long. Um, for those who heard me speak in uh, London, you might be wondering what, uh, why I'm talking about InfoMax. Uh, so I'll spend, the f it's very different from what I usually work on. Uh, so I'll spend the first 25% of the talk just giving you some inf uh, motivation for how I got to work on this. Uh, it's related to a project I've been involved in on something we call computational photography. So I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, so really our goal was not to, we just wanted to use InfoMax. We didn't want to invent anything new, but we ended up rather proving some what we found to be very surprising uh, theoretical results on InfoMax. Um, I'll show you some experiments that actually support our theory uh, and talk about the what I think are the implications of our results for computational photography and computational neuroscience. <coughs> Uh, so what is computational photography? Um, computational photography, it's a new subfield of engineering, computer science, optics, uh, which talks about designing new cameras. And what makes it different from traditional cameras is that the camera captures measurements, not images. And when you say that, that, that doesn't sound very different, but um, contrast that with traditional cameras certainly analog cameras, where either you work very hard to make the optics just capture a, a copy, a local copy, of what's outside in the world. So it's really an analog of the signal. In computational photography, these things that are measured by the camera can be arbitrary numbers. Um, sorry? Because um, before you um, develop the film, you're actually going to put a computer in the loop. So whatever these numbers were that were captured, there's going to be a computer here that will sort of decode these numbers and give you a photograph in the end. Um, let me show you some examples of what people can do today in computational photography. Um, this is um, work of my uh, former student, Anat Levine, um, who was trying to solve the problem of motion blur. So, you know, if you take a, cam a conventional camera and take a picture of a scene like this, everything that's moving will be blurred. Um, and people can work very hard on reducing the exposure time. That's one way to reduce blurs. You can try to capture the scene with a very small exposure. But then you don't have enough light. There's all sorts of other problems. Their camera actually makes it that every, everything is blurred, the static part and the moving parts. And that's terrible from the point of view of a conventional camera. Because if what you display to the user is what was captured, um, having everything blurred is bad. But because there's a computer in the loop, what they can do is take this output and then run an algorithm on it, um, and then everything is sharp. So these are the kinds of things, once you start exploring the space of computational cameras, where what is measured by the camera is not necessarily an image, uh, you have a lot more freedom in designing the camera. I think the most... Um, extreme version of a computational camera is what's known as compressed sensing. Um, I'm sure many of you have already heard of compressed sensing. It's one of these things in mathematics that went from being very obscure to being a cliche in almost two years. It's really amazing to observe. Uh, but for those who haven't, a very brief introduction is in the compressed sensing applied to this problem, what your camera measures is basically a set of random projections of the input signal. So every pixel just measures a random linear combination of the input image. So if you were to look at the output, what's captured by the camera, uh, as an image, it would look nothing like the image, right? It's just a bunch of random numbers. And yet, using a computer to decode these numbers under certain conditions, we can reconstruct a high-resolution image. Um, and this is based on a theorem that's by now six years old, but really it's um, lots and lots of additional work ever since that shows that under certain conditions, even though the number of coefficients, the reason it's called compressed sensing, is the number of pixels, so to speak, the number of measurements that your camera takes, can be much, much smaller than the dimensionality of your input. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, you know, 8 million numbers in your image, measuring only, say, 5,000 numbers, and under certain very restricted conditions, you can go ahead and reconstruct these 8 million numbers exactly. Okay, so I got interested in this problem um, after sort of hearing all these uh, tr very interesting talks about compressed sensing, 
Uh, I worked on it a little bit. Sort of a short story is that me and others have discovered that it doesn't really work very well for natural images. That if you really want to design a camera and you take these random projections uh, and then try to reconstruct, you don't really get these beautiful um, high resolution images out. Uh, and the short story there is that these images are not really these ideal sparse signals that the mathematicians like to work with. But this led us to a different question, which is, okay, let's forget about sparsity for a second. Uh, let's define the following problem, is we have a signal, say the space of natural images, and we're allowed to observe these signals for as long as we want. We're allowed to collect statistics on them. Uh, we know whatever, how, how, to the best, to the arbitrarily good uh, resolution, we know the statistics of our signals. And we want to design um, a camera, which in this case is just going to be a linear projection. It's going to take our n-dimensional signal and project it down to p dimensions. And, we're going to, and then we're going to have some algorithm later that will reconstruct from this, uh, these coefficients that will reconstruct the image. And the question is, what is the best camera, so to speak, or what is the best projection matrix that one could choose? So we've been working on this for a while, and here's how we got to InfoMax. We said, well, a very reasonable criterion is that whatever this measurement should do is it should give us measurements that are maximally informative about the image, that the mutual information between the measurements and the input image will be as high as possible. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the InfoMax principle. It was actually presented at the first NIPS meeting, 1982, um, by Linsker. Uh, you know, in early, earlier versions of this go back to Barlow, and if you want to go back earlier, maybe it's even Helmholtz. Uh, but this idea of uh, efficient coding says that basically the goal of early sensory coding is to maximize the information between the neural representation and the visual stimulus. So unlike in computational photography, we as human beings or biological organisms, we don't need to reconstruct an image out here. Uh, but we still want our measurements to be as informative as possible. About, what's go about the visual world. Um, and so our thought was that we could use the results in computational neuroscience about the InfoMax principle in order to design the best cameras. So whatever is the solution to the InfoMax problem for biological organisms, you would expect would also give us a hint about how to design good cameras or good sensors in engineering. So specifically, we expected that in the end, the optimal camera, the InfoMax camera, would have receptive fields that look like Gabor functions. That was our hypothesis. Um, so as uh, many of you know, the InfoMax principle has been very successfully used in computational neuroscience. Uh, if you only take into consideration the second order statistics, uh, you can recover receptive fields that look like the LGM. Xiaoping, where's Xiaoping? Was involved in some of this earlier work. Uh, David Field, uh, if you assume the output of the LGN has already done something called whitening, that is that the signal uh, now has a unit covariance matrix, and you run the InfoMax principle, you can get receptive fields that look like V1. So that's really what we expected uh, to come out. Uh, but what we wanted first to do is just, um, you know, these are two very specific results. We want to say, can we solve this InfoMax problem for a general input distribution? Um, if so, does it give new predictions for computational neuroscience? Um, and does this tell us how to design cameras or sensors? So let me explain what I mean by solving. Uh, you'd think this is, you know, since the first NIPS meeting, it's been over 20 years, I guess. 82 is... <laughs> almost, yeah, almost 30 years now, wow. Uh, you'd think that this problem would be solved. I mean, Linsker defined the problem. It's a very well defined mathematical problem, you would think that others would have solved it by now. Uh, so, but, other than the, but it turns out that so the, the problem's generality is not yet solved. And let me just explain what the problem is and what we, the solution we'd like to get. So, you know, people have been talking throughout today about recurrent neural networks and replica methods. Here, it's going to be very simple. Everything is feed-forward, linear to begin with. This is the linear InfoMax problem. Uh, so let's just define it very carefully. Just a feed forward, let's forget about cameras for a second in V1 and so forth. X is your input, Y is your output, Y equals W times X, and we add some noise. The input distribution is known, there's no learning here. I tell you, the, I have an analytical formula for the distribution of your input. 
what is the best, in terms of InfoMax, what is the optimal output? How, what should your representation of this input be? And um, best in the, in the sense of information, but unlike Peter's talk, this is Shannon's information, or initial information. Um, and of course, the ideal W, as Linsker said, it ma maximizes the mutual information. And since uh, the Shannon information is this difference of entropies, saying that we want our representation to be maximally informative about the outside world is equivalent to saying that given the representation, we have the minimal amount of uncertainty about the world. Or alternatively, since this is, doesn't depend on your representation, we want our representation, given the statistics of the world, to have maximal entropy. If your representation has, is always saying the same thing, regardless of what's going on in the world, it's obviously not very informative. You want to maximize uh, the entropy of your representation. So, so yeah. just playing a formal role. Excuse me? Eta, the noise, just playing a formal role. Yeah, actually, I'm going to set, take the limit as the noise goes to zero, uh, very soon. Uh, although it is also interesting from the engineering standpoint, uh, the result ends up changing as a, as a result. You get different optimality principles depending on the amount of noise. But we'll be interested mostly in the zero noise limit to begin with. Peter? OK. And then there's the nonlinear InfoMax problem. It's the same thing, but you, you're allowed to add uh, a sigmoidal nonlinearity on top. So, you know, it's a very well-defined problem. Everything is linear. You'd think we have a solution by now. What's known? Oh, first of all, about the linear case. You have to normalize them. Yes, this is exactly. You need some constraints. Um, in the linear case, you need constraints. Uh, because you can trivially ma maximize the information by taking some w and multiplying it by a large number. And uh, sort of a natural constraint is a power budget. So the total sum of your synapses, so to speak, has to be constant. Um, this turns out to be equivalent to requiring that W be orthogonal. It's not trivial, actually, this proof, but it, uh, but it's, it ends up being uh, the same. So basically, really, the restriction is the total number of the total energy in all your synapses. The, the sum of the norms of all the rows of W is less than the constant, and this implies essentially that W is an orthogonal matrix, that your uh, filters, so to speak, or your receptive fields are orthogonal to each other and have the same uh, norm. OK, so what is known so far about InfoMax? Um, so again, the Linsker posed the problem and proved also a solution for a very specific case. In the linear case, um, one more restriction I didn't say, of course, that in the linear case, uh, w ha the, the has to do some compression. That is, the dimensionality of your output has to be less than the dimensionality of your input. Otherwise, you just take a full matrix and you preserve all information. It's not very interesting. But if you are forced uh, to reduce the dimension, um, what's the most informative representation of your input? And Linsker showed that if the input is Gaussian, then the answer is PCA. That is, you should project onto, if you have P uh, dimensions, you should project onto the P principal components. Uh, and about 10 years later, also at NIFS, uh, Belenzijnovsky showed that if W is square, if you look at the nonlinear case, and W is square, uh, and the input has independent components, meaning there are actually independent components, uh, the input is actually a linear superposition of independent sources, and the nonlinearity exactly matches what's not the, the cumulative density of your inputs, then InfoMax gives ICA. And a short aside is I teach here after Chaim and Chanoch, and one day I saw on the whiteboard a proof of this. So I guess at least the ICNC students should be well familiar with this proof. But these are two very specific cases. You know, we, we, we're interested in arbitrary distributions, not necessarily Gaussian, and we're, presumably the nonlinearity can be whatever we want. What's the solution in the general case? And that's what really we needed in order to design our computational cameras. Uh, because in the compressed sensing, we don't want W to be square, so these results are not that interesting. And we certainly don't want to use it in a world where everything is Gaussian, which is in, in these highly non-Gaussian cases. So what is the solution for this most general case? Okay, so surprisingly, this sort of, um, I think, goes well with Larry's talk and some other talks today. Uh, it turns out what we're going to prove is that the linear InfoMax, the solution ends up being random projections. So for a large set of different um, input distributions, InfoMax actually gives you random projections. So as Larry said, you shouldn't use the word random if there are neuroscientists in the audience. Uh, but here, random really means random. The best W is just choose IID every element of W. 
and we're going to show that that's the optimal in the informatic sense. That's the solution. Yes. So it's, it's random orthogonal. Random orthogonal. Although I, these are all large n things, so they, everything, even if you choose them iid and zero mean, and you, uh, they're going to be orthogonal anyway. But yes, random and orthogonal. Um, and the, that for that's for another surprising result. And again, thinking of what. Chaim and Chanoch teacher on this very whiteboard is that the, in the linear Infomax case, ICA is actually the worst thing you could do, and we're going to prove this. It actually minimizes the mutual information, doesn't maximize it. And finally, we have some results on the nonlinear Infomax, which is harder to analyze. And here again, if, if you're doing a lot of compression uh, and the fixed G, even here, random projections are the best thing to do. Okay. So one way maybe to um, recap, to sort of illustrate what our results show is in terms of one of my favorite Seinfeld episodes. So there's one Seinfeld episode where George decides to do everything the opposite. You know, he says he walks into the room, he listens to what his gut instincts tell him to do, and he does the opposite. And then he has this tremendous success. He has success with women, he has success with girls. He always just does the opposite. Um, and in a way, what our results are showing is that ICA is like George Costanza. Instead, instead of maximizing, it's, it's looking at how to maximize the information, but doing the opposite. It's actually going in the exact opposite direction. So actually, you can get ICA by solving this problem. Find me an orthogonal projection that tells me the least amount of information about the input. <laughs> that gives you ICA. OK. So let's prove this. What's nice about this proof is that it has very deep and fundamental mathematics, none of which was done by us. <laughs> so uh, we, there's a very trivial, um, I'll give you some very simple argument, and then all the deep stuff is by, was done by mathematicians earlier. OK. So the proof is, the simple observation is that if you're in, uh, this is all for a white input, I should say. So again, if you have non-white input, like, uh, then often, P, you know, then if you're, the second order correlations are taken into account, often PCA is the best thing to do. But let's suppose that you've whitened the input so there are no longer any second order correlations. Um, and now we're going to solve. This is the, so this is the, set, the setting which I'm going to talk about. Uh, and that, what that means is that the covariance of Y is the identity because W is an orthogonal matrix, X was white, Y is also going to be white. So what's the maximum entry distribution subject to a covariance being I? Well, that's a Gaussian. That's a very uh, standard result that the maximum entropy distribution that has unit covariance is the Gaussian. So really, if you want to do Infomax, you want to find a projection that, that is as Gaussian as possible. And again, I have to bring up George Costanza here because there's 20 years or 30 years worth of research in statistics that says if I have some high dimensional data, Find me the projections that are most non-Gaussian, because those are, you would think, are the interesting projections. Well, that's fine. They are interesting, but they're the least informative ones. So if you do projection pursuit or ICA, you're really trying to find the least informative projections. But this problem, not that many people have worked on, how to find the most Gaussian. That is, find me a distribution that no matter what the input looked like, when you project it down, it's going to be this Gaussian. And that is the Infomax solution. OK, now we come to this. Um, deep mathematics, which was not done by us, there's a lot of very interesting work on the properties of random projections, which basically show that if you take some arbitrary dis input distribution and take a random projection of it, again, a random orthogonal matrix, uh, then Y will be Gaussian. Um, but, but it's efficient Yes, there are other ways to make it Gaussian. What? There are other ways, maybe, to get it to be Gaussian. But, you, but the random is the best you can do. You can't do any better. What? Because what is the statement about the optimality of random? Okay, so we just say that it's Gaussian in the limit, but many things will also make it Gaussian. So, so I mean, it's, it, it's a same to limit theorem. So you can just sum them; it also will be Gaussian. Uh, well, but you, you can call it. Yes, you need uh, p dimensions, not just one dimension. You need it to be jointly Gaussian. The what? You need this to be jointly Gaussian. It's not enough that a central limit theorem just says that if you sum, you know, if you take the sum, the average of a lot of them, you'll get a, a scalar Gaussian. The hard part, what, to get Infomax, you want your whole vector to be jointly Gaussian. Jointly uncorrelated? So you really want the 
Yes, you, you want the kavod. No, they, they will not be correlated. They will not be correlated because it's white. So there is no issue of correlation. But you want them to be, again, um, no. okay. you want them to be really that's, like that's, this. That's that. But don't, don't I say also. No, but this because is like. Humanity also gives you the, 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 the variance to be equal. Yeah, but it could be like this. There are a lot of projections. This is a white projection that. Of course, if you take identity matrix, then it will be like this. Yes. Or something like that. So I'm not saying everything will be Gaussian, but I wonder what is the statement about the optimality of random projections? Yeah, so the, the random projections are as Gaussian as you can be. That is the point. You cannot be more Gaussian than that. That's, that's the statement that, that is proved. For, um, but uh, the specific yeah, result. Really, that every matrix does it. If you just sum it, it all right. any, every matrix will be Gaussian. Yeah. But you want them also to be. A, yeah. You want them also to be orthogonal. It's not um, if you sum. But, but I'm asking, what is the precise statement about the optimality of random matrix in this sense? Yes, okay, so let, let me say this again. So first of all, um, the, these mathematical statements basically show that as long as the number of projections is less than square root of n, okay, grows slower than square root of n, then as both the dimension and the projection dimension go to infinity, then random projections will be perfectly Gaussian. Which, and you can't be more Gaussian than that. That is, the, the KL divergence between the distribution of Y and the Gaussian will go to zero. But maybe other, other projections will make it faster go to zero. For a fixed N, yes. No, but the, in the limit. But in the limit, there's no, you can't be more than that. No, 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 no. the rate of convergence. Okay, I'll show, I'll show the proof in a little bit and we can talk about it. But okay. ba basically, it achieves the limit. The limit is not unique because almost any matrix achieves it, right? Yes. <laughs> but, it, but I'm saying it's not worth your effort to try to find something better. You're not going to get better than the random projections. Um, the, the entropy will be as high as you can be. Okay. Um, the other result is for this nonlinear case. Um, so basically, this is the Belen-Szyznowski result. Belen-Szyznowski mostly talked about the complete case, when the number of uh, dimensions is equal to the uh, number of sensors. Uh, it turns, the proof actually can be easily generalized also for the undercomplete case as well. So if, if your nonlinearity exactly matches the CDF of your sources, then just choosing ICA projections maximizes, uh, is still uh, info max. But this requires a very tight coupling between what the source distribution is and your nonlinearity. In the engineering setting, and I think also in the brain, you can think of G as being dictated by the physics in some way. It's not, you can't play with it. G is something about the dynamic range, and you'd like something that, no matter what the statistics of your input are, you can use the same G, and again, you can show that random projections. If, if you choose G to be an error function, that is a CDF of a Gaussian, uh, then no matter what your input distribution is, uh, you could get the nonlinear InfoMax solution using random projections. Um, whoops, so I'm missing an answer to Chaim's question. Oh, yeah, this one, sorry. Um, one interesting thing is the, all these previous results from the 70s show you uh, only hold for a relatively small number of projections. That is, there's a limit on how many projections you can do and still be Gaussian. And this kind of makes sense, because if all the projections are Gaussian, that means the original signal were Gaussian, right? That means your original signal was jointly Gaussian. So there's an upper limit, this sort of square root of the D projections that you're allowed to take. Uh, so what we do here is we can also show that even um, for all, even if you increase the number of projections, then you can no longer achieve Gaussianity. But we can still show that random projections optimize the entropy. That is, they achieve an upper bound on the entropy, and ICA minimizes the exact same approximation. I can talk, I'd be happy to talk more about this later because to prove this, we have what we think is a new approxim approximation for the joint entropy of Y. Um, anyway, but these results are given that joint, en we, we do a particular approximation, and that same approximation is maximized by Gaussian, uh, by a random projection, no matter the, the dimensions, and is minimized by ICA no matter what the size of the... So yeah? All this discussion so far would seem to indicate the random projection of blueberry pie and natural seeds. Are you going to tell us why that makes sense? Yeah, um, th this is important. Uh, I said this, I'll say it again. This is all for white input. If the input is not white, the entropy depends on two things, the Gaussianity on the one hand and the variance. 
So you know, the larger the variance, the larger the entropy, right? So if your input is really not white, then PCA is often does better than anything else. White means the covariance matrix is the identity. So, so you have the same variance along no matter what dimension you look at. And natural images are not like that at all. That's the first story. Okay, so let me show some experiments. Um, the results are asymptotic. So a lot of these sort of classical results are asymptotic, and we, we're interested in what you can do with sort of finite size effects. And they also require you to know the distribution of your input, although for the random projection it doesn't matter. Uh, but what if you just have samples? You don't know P of X. So here are the experiments. We just get a training set of your inputs, and we numerically find both the info max and the info min projections. And to do info max and info min, we use a relatively new um, estimator of the entropy based on nearest neighbors, uh, appeared two years ago at NIPS. And we just do gradient descent or ascent on this function. Okay, so the first set of experiments are just these synthetic patches. Um, so these are five by five patches where every pixel is IID from a heavy tail distribution. So most of these pixels are off. Every once in a while you get a non-zero pixel. So it's sort of a very toy model of what a sparse distribution looks like. What are the independent components of this? The pixels. So if you were to run the ICA because the pixels are independent, what ICA would find are individual pixels. So, well, they are the independent components. If you want, if you tell the algorithm to only find two, but individual pixels are independent. Yeah. Uh, these are projections that are, are independent. Um, so when we work on three by three patches, um, so if you do info max, you get these things. I don't know. It's hard to tell what random means and then when you only have nine. Info min, on the other hand, you, you very this is projecting down to two dimensions, it basically looks at two pixels. The solution is only up to a rotation, right? Because we can always take this and rotate it, and the entropy won't change. The mutual information won't change. So basically, the, min, the info min solution just finds two pixels in some linear combination of them. Um, and random, at least here, is not as Gaussian as info max. So this goes back to what you can see there's still some strong structure left when you project from nine dimensions down to two whereas InfoMax makes it even more random. Uh, another thing, this goes back um, to a talk we heard here about a week ago by uh, Ron Meir. He said, you know, we shouldn't talk about mutual information at all. It's a total waste of time. Really, what we care about is least squares, mean squared error. Mutual information is for... Also, at some point, he's also bashing uh, Shannon information. Anyway. Uh, Lots of people say, what do we care about this mutual information? Let's go for mean squared error. So we just did some experiments. We actually tried to reconstruct the image from the projection and measured mean squared error um, as a function of the compression ratio. So of course, if there's no compression, there's no error. Um, but as you compress more and more, uh, random uh, projections and infomax, that's these curves, they give you much lower error. And infomin, or ICA, gives you much higher reconstruction errors. So unlike, uh, it, in many cases, mean squared error and mutual information give you totally different predictions. In these cases, it's, in all the experiments we've done, it's the same. The projections that are good in terms of mean squared error are also good in terms of information. So that's for nine dimensions. If we go to 49 dimensions, you see that the difference between infomax and random really goes away. Already here, random projections, you can't really do much better than that, and the curves really line up. But still, um, info min just finds a pair of pixels, or ICA. It's the same as ICA. OK, this is sort of fun. And we take white and 7 by 7 natural image patches, and we ask, what are the most informative projections for the out input of, take the output of the LGN, and I would train an info max thing to maximize the information between the output and the LGN output. This is the same as, as is this something new, or this is the same as the set as the but these are real images, real natural images. White. white and natural images, yes. Um, and now you see that InfoMax learns uh, random projections, random looking projections. Again, there's a difference in this is the uh, information here. So it's a little bit better than purely taking the matrix to be random. Uh, InfoMin finds these oriented, localized things, uh, very similar to what you get with ICA. 
And this is a seven by seven uh, patches, so you can't see the Gabor structure very well. Uh, the reconstruction results are the same. Again, as you compress more, the Gabor filters give you the worst possible reconstruction. Um, and here is uh, the George Costanza ICA algorithm. Take uh, 16 by 16 image patches and find the least informative output and you get these things that are localized both in space and in frequency and in orientation. So if you do, instead of doing info max on the output of the LGN, and do info min, uh, you get Gabor filters. Okay, so what are the implications of these? Yes? So if you go back to slides, the, the difference in information was very small between the info max and the random, but maybe from here it seems like there's a structure in the info max patches which is very different than the random one? Um, Okay, there, there might be some, one thing is the InfoMax one we rotate, uh, the solution to InfoMax is only given up to rotation. Um, so I, I don't remember how exactly we choose the rotation, so it might be that we're trying to maximize some structure to see there. Um, but it does look to be, um, for seven by seven patches, I mean, this difference is significant. I mean, if, even if you repeat the experiment over and over again, random patches don't get this number. Random. Pr no, I think the main thing is really that what you want is this also is you want the um, these the filters to be as global as possible. That the uh, so what Lachine's intuition was correct. If you sum all the things, that's good. Or if you do one minus one, one minus one, that's also good. If you just IID take random IID samples. It's not necessarily going to be as dense. I think that's the main structure that you get. So if you look at the distribution of the values in the two matrices, in the patches of the random and the increment, is the gray level? Yeah, I, I, we haven't done that, but I think that's what's, that you will see a difference. I should say this is only for 40. If you go to like 16 by 16 patches, you don't see any difference anymore. The, they're really random, does everything uh, you need. Uh, this is linear or nonlinear? This is linear. Everything's linear. We don't have the algorithm, unfortunately, working. Uh, it, doing the actual InfoMax is, it, numerically speaking, is hard. So, uh, yeah. Does it matter random from one to distribution? The weights. Uh, for the proof, no. All, all these proofs. For the performance. Um, it's uniform uh, weights of. Gaussian. So I don't know. We, in the experiments, we just did um, Gaussian, zero mean Gaussian for everyone. We didn't try the others. It has to be zero mean, obviously. Um, but the proof, all these proofs, the mathematical proofs, they hold for any distribution, basically. Uh, you get it. Okay, so what are the implications of this for computational photography and computational neuroscience? So one question is maybe V1, we were all looking for the wrong things. You know, we got nature papers by showing Gabor filters, but really the right nature paper, if someone were to show the random projections, uh, well, not our, maybe that's true, but that's not predicted by our results because V1 doesn't do compression, right? Uh, the number of neurons in V1 is much larger than the number of neurons in the LGN. So uh, for that regime, if you have the right nonlinearity, the balanced of result still holds. Uh, on the other hand, some other places in the brain where the, num where the number of, where the output uh, dimension is much smaller than the input dimension, maybe the basal ganglia, maybe some other, if you believe in InfoMax, uh, then this would predict that in, in some brain areas, you might very well see, uh, this would predict that you should see somewhere uh, cells whose receptive fields are basically random, if you believe in InfoMax. So I think that's an interesting prediction that would be fun if somebody could test. Well, there's a second part in the sense that the input has to be white. Sorry? So the input has to be white. So yes. Sort of two predictions, two predictions. Yeah, but I think doesn't the uh, thalamus do whitening for in all modalities? I don't know. Ish. Okay. Uh, yes. I was assuming that whitening was already taken care of. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay well, what about computational photography? This goes back to Peter's question earlier. So you hear all these talks about random projections for cameras, and that's true also by our analysis. Random cameras would be the best thing to do if you wanted to take your camera for images like this. That is, if you want to use your camera only on whitened images, um, then indeed a random camera is the best thing to do. But you know, natural images, 
It looked like this. I think this image is copyrighted by the Hebrew University, right? Come on. <laughs> so we are allowed to. Maybe not this one. Then random projections are not the right thing to do here. Um, we've been working on this now for about two, more than two years. It's not easy. When, when the data is not white, we still don't know the solution to Infomax. We don't have a closed form solution. Uh, we know Gaussian on one sense, and we know white on the other sense, white arbitrary distribution. But this natural images, which are not white and on Gaussian, uh, we have some numerical approximations. But in general, just doing PCA, whenever the data has significant second order structure, PCA usually outperforms random projections. Um, so if you hear all these talks about random projections, tell them, why don't you just try PCA? Uh, in fact, some people from the compressed sensing world um, are also using PCA-like projections now as well. OK, so let me end. Um, I think one thing I wanted to get across is the, this field called computational photography. Sometimes it's called computational imaging. I think it's a great growth area for computational neuroscience. Uh, because it's really, uh, there, I think there's a lot of interesting collaborations because we're in the old traditional photography, the best camera was something that measured things that looked good to a human. But that's not the case anymore. Now the best cameras or the best sensors are ones that have information for a computer to decode. And now you have much closer, um, I think, um, interplay with sort of biological sensing mechanisms. You know, for example, there are different optics used by different organisms, each of which are optimal using different uh, criteria. And many of these optimality criteria are also useful in computational photography. And some of this is actually starting to happen. Uh, computational cameras that use particular lenses that they find in some kind of fish. Uh, so I think this is a great growth area. Um, what I talked about was the Infomax criterion. It's over 20 years old but still unsolved, and I encourage anyone, we haven't solved it either. Uh, in the general case, there's still a lot of work to be done, but at least for white data, under-complete random projections are the most informative, while under-complete ICA projections are the least informative. Thank you. I have a question first. Uh, so obviously, Infomax is the wrong criterion. And you want something which carries the relevant information, not everything. And only the, these things which are really important for behavior, whatever they are. And we know already that how to do Information it. bottleneck is the solution. Also, information <laughs> bottleneck. Okay. And if you do it for the Gaussian case, as you know well, you get the CCA, not the yes. I just wonder if there is some sort of a tilted random projection that actually give you canonical correlation instead of uh, PCA. Yeah. The same spirit. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good direction to explore. You know, I think the argument in Linsker's favor is that if you have a general purpose vision visual area, it should be useful for lots and lots of tasks. And so it, the, uh, it's, it's not, you, you know, you're not just trying to, to, to find things that are relevant for one particular visual task, but for all of them. Um, so I think, I think info, for that Infomax, I would still believe is uh, useful. But yes, anyway, it's for mathematically, I'm very happy to study the the two variable setting as well. So, as you said, uh, you, the solution uh, is, uh, is uh, a degeneracy because you can always uh, invent to, to a patient uh, yeah. cost, right? So, one way to think about about uh, this this the, the entire problem is you have some data, you, you, know, you do you do dimensional entry reduction, you find whatever PCA or something, and then Within the reduced dimension, you want to find the optimal set of coordinates or the optimal projections. So if I follow this argument, then I would say, OK, fine. So you, you found the optimal dimensionality reduction projection, uh, sorry, you know, so it, it should, should be compared to PCA. And you are saying this random projection is the optimal one. Because the data is white, PCA is not going to do exactly, much. Exactly. <laughs> and now the point is, but. What, what next? After uh, you did this dimensionality reduction, we would like to find what is the, the unique solution, the optimal unique solution, and then you will find again ICA. Yeah, well, yes, it's, it's certainly in the nonlinear case. Well, in the nonlinear. You, you have to introduce something, otherwise, uh, there is not, nothing else to do. But yes. You add nonlinearity and so on, but then you will get back into ICA. No, but, but the one, thing to, one thing to remember is that if you. Um, 
If the random projections really made everything Gaussian... No, 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 but that's it. I'm not talking about that. No, no, then, brain, the, then the ICA has brain. nothing left to do. I know, but not in free brain. But I'm saying <laughs> this is exactly the mixing of the ICA. The ICA assumes that the signal is almost Gaussian, but not, not exactly Gaussian because it's a linear mixture of things which are not Gaussian. And that's precisely what you have after your projection. You have something which is close to Gaussian. But not exactly, yes. Not exactly. And now if you want within this to do the ICA, then you will to ICA to uncover the... Yeah, could be. But uh, at least our, what we, it's, it, we have, on the nonlinear thing, we haven't done a lot of work, um, not as much as we'd like. But it doesn't, it looks like the random projections already do, they make things as independent as you can make them anyway. Uh, because again, if, if everything were Gaussian and they're uncorrelated, then they're also independent. Well, but then there is no question that ICA is irrelevant because you are saying that the... No, the yeah, input, the input, Gaussian. the input is not Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's surprising how Gaussian you can really make things, even if it was very non-Gaussian to begin with. These random projections don't leave ICA a lot of work to do. But uh, I'm not advocating that uh, we stop teaching ICA. Uh, it's still useful. Uh, I, I challenge you to use ICA on your on, on your output. Yeah, in a way we did. When we uh, no 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 the um, these on results. The, on these solutions. No, these results are rotated. We show a particular rotation, but it doesn't change. It doesn't change the entropy. It's just for display terms, right? The entropy. This number is invariant to whatever I see. It does. Yeah. Um, but it, no. the, yeah. This is also the. I should say, in fairness, the info min doesn't necessarily give you Gabor filters. It gives you Gabor filters up to a rotation only. Thank you for coming.